Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Traders Summit. And with me today, I have the one and only Mark Chandler from Bannockburn Forex. Good to see you, Mark. Always a pleasure to see you. It's always a pleasure to see you. And you know, interesting thing is the last time that we had this discussion, we 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 met up, we were talking about Fed funds futures and and how you really calculate them. How do you see the market right now? I mean, we're seeing a lot of seems like a lot of move in rates. So, so what's happened in your eyes? Uh, between now and the last time we met several weeks ago. Yeah, that's one of the amazing things that's happened in the last several weeks, really uh, since the end of uh, September. FOMC met, so did the Bank of England, and the Bank of Canada met a bit earlier in the month. And we've seen a sharp backing up of interest rates at the very short end of the curve. What this means is the market is positioned now for a rate hike from the UK this year, a rate hike by the Bank of Canada, around the middle of next year, maybe even more than 25 basis points. And the amazing thing here in the U.S., and this is after we had that disappointing jobs data, is the market now is pricing in very aggressively, um, how very aggressively what the Fed's going to do next year. Wow. So last time we spoke, I said that September Fed fund futures at about 15 and a half basis points was pricing in a Fed hike. The yield today is 22 basis points. Wow. So what that tells me is the Fed, the market is pricing in not only one 25 basis point rate hike for the September meeting, but there's about a one in three chance of 50 basis points instead of 25. And so you can confirm this by looking at the December contract. And the December contract, I said last time at about 22 basis points, it was, it was assuming one 25 basis point rate hike this year at, 20, at 22 basis points. And today, it's at 37 and a half basis points. So this is the market, it seems to me, to be saying that the, mar the market says that the Federal Reserve is going to raise rates at least once and maybe twice next year. And remember what we had at those September dot plots. Only half of the Federal Reserve officials thought that there'd be a one rate hike next year. And the market's saying there's about 37 and a half basis points of tightening priced in. Wow. That's crazy. And so, we, and we've really seen it reflected in the dollar over the last several weeks since we did last meet. We've seen the dollar index nearing that 9450 level, which is a big, big Fibonacci level for the market. I know, a lot, you know, we just keep knocking our head up against it. But what's been really explosive just over the last few sessions, we've seen the dollar yen break out and actually overnight at the time of filming uh, this, this, this meeting of, of you and myself, we're seeing the dollar yen actually break out. So what is that telling you as far as the yen goes? Is this a is this a yield move or is this a dollar move or maybe a little bit of both or maybe it's a yen move? Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. I think that uh, you know I, I people often think we're looking at them in the markets as co different correlations, and I think we have to be careful of the situation where there's you know there's a very high correlation between the number of mortuaries and the number of churches in a city. But of course, the reason that there's correlation is not that one is causing the other, right? The reason yeah. there's a high correlation is they're correlated to a third thing, population size. So similarly, it seems to me that the dollar yen is reacting to the same forces that are driving up U.S. interest rates. So it'll show, I mean, I, I just run these correlations a lot. I keep an eye on these to look at these intermarket relationships. And the dollar yen is highly correlated to the U.S. Treasury yield. By highly correlated, I mean, you know, with a what I'm looking at now, what a lot of people do in our industry is they'll just take a look at the level of the dollar yen and the level of interest rates and do a correlation. That's not really the best way to do that. The better, the, the better way, the more rigorous way is to do the change in the treasury yield and the change in dollar yen and do that correlation on the percentage change or the differences. And you get a more robust, statistically more robust, and we do ourselves a favor as investors to take a more robust tool. We do the correlation like that, we're looking at something like 0.6%, which is quite high for, for these kind of variables. Yeah. And not only is it high, but it's also been relatively stable at these kind of levels. So I think that what's going on is that for, for various reasons, the uh, market has taken up U.S. 10-year yields. Partly, I'd say it's a tapering that we all know now is going to take place next month, November. Uh, but it's also uh, other things are going on too, right? Besides just the Fed tapering, I'm thinking about the jump in oil prices which are incredible. I mean, imagine, you know, April, 2020, we're talking about negative 
price for oil. That was and nuts. That was mind boggling. Yes. Right? And now we're talking about eighty five dollars a barrel for oil. And I don't I don't know many people who anticipated this kind of rally in oil prices. But the bottom line here is as oil prices go up, people have this idea that it's going to drive inflation higher, and it's going to and also think about what Japan does. Japan is a big importer, a net importer of oil, so their balance of payments is going to deteriorate as they have to import more expensive oil. So there's a lot of different things that are mixed up with the U.S. 10-year yield and dollar yen, but I think that's what's telling us. And as I was saying before, you know, I kind of think that dollar yen, in my experience, is largely a range-bound currency. And when it looks like it's trending, it's moving to a new range. And so part of my job is trying to figure out, well, what's that new range going to be? So the old range was 109 to 111, say. And of course, they're not perfect ranges, and we get frayed edges, and you get false breaks. Sure. But so now that we're last week we closed above 112, and we are just accelerating, and so it seems to me, to your point, we're clearly breaking to the high upper end of this. And so where are we going to go? And I think that the next, so so if we're going to go to the next range, where's that upper end of the next range? I suspect it's going to be about 114 and a half to 115. Uh, those levels are kind of important from uh, several years ago, and that's why sort of like hard to say this, right? But we haven't seen these levels for several years. So support and resistance tend to, you want to see what what a macroeconomist will call where a supply comes in, we would think of it as resistance. And where demand comes in, we think of it as support. And so it's not clear where that where those uh, supplies are going to come in. But in the past, that 114.50 to uh, 115 area has been important, but you have to go back to like 2017, 2018 to find it. Well, so you know, so if I'm 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 sitting here expecting us to make a make a move to 150 yen, I might be disappointed. 150 yen. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but but I think that I think that you know you got the momentum uh, in your favor. Uh, the, the market seems to be a bit stretched to me right now as yeah. we speak here today. It looks to me like we're on we're above the Bollinger Band, and you know these uh, there's nothing magical about it, right? It's it said basically how far can the rubber band stretch in the short term. It's basically two standard deviations beyond the 20-day moving average. And it's, it's, for me, it's not like carved in stone or anything, but it just tells me to be a bit careful when dollar sure. yen is, is going to close above it. It comes in around 112.90 now. And that's the other thing that I find important in the foreign exchange market, but in the markets in general, is, is that support and resistance doesn't just go away. What previously was resistance, say 112 area, now probably becomes support for the dollar. And so support and resistance can turn into each other, like the country can turn into its opposite. Yeah. So that, I think that's how we're going to find the bottom end of the range, the top end of the old range. Now, I was just joking about the 150 yen, obviously, but, um, but I, what I really wanted to ask you, and I think is more important, is for those of us that have been trading FX markets for the last 20 years, let's say, you know, if you remember the, the mid early 2000s and, and really into the latter, you know, 2008, 2007, you know, the yen carry trade was quite the thing. And that was a, that was a big weapon that a lot of portfolio managers used. So are we seeing that carry trade phenomenon come back into the FX market where you're, where, where everybody's anticipating higher rates by the rest of the world, but not Japan minus Japan is what I meant to say. Yeah, no, I, th- I think partly you're right. I think that like, you know, what we've experienced with the pandemic is we all became like, oh, got squeezed down to zero or yeah. below. And I think that now, as the uh, as we think we've got the pandemic more increasingly under control or less uh, less dangerous than it was, uh, that the interest rate differentials, people begin moving off that zero bound. We've already seen it in some countries. Uh, Norway, New Zealand have already hiked. And I mentioned there's been a sharp backing up of U.S., Canadian, uh, and British rates uh, in emerging market space. That's the other kind of interesting thing. I don't think, so I do think that the carry trade dollar yen is clear. I think Canada's strength is partly the aggressiveness markets pricing in for the Bank of Canada. But I think that the emerging markets aren't really being uh, treated in the same vein. And I think about like, you know, since the, uh, the Federal Reserve meeting, say September 22nd, I think that the JP Morgan Emerging Market Currency Index has only risen one or two days. That is to say, emerging markets are really underperforming in this higher U.S. interest rate, more aggressive Fed stance that people suspect. So maybe the carry trade, maybe within the major countries, within the highly liquid accessible currencies, you do have some carry trade developing. Uh, I'd be watching, uh, there. you know, the Swiss franc is the other one that's a big laggard. Uh, you know, the even while the dollar yen is making new highs, dollar, uh, the euro is really flat. 
uh, holding below 116, a lot of optionality in the next couple of days expiring around that 116 area. Uh, that Fibonacci level you talked about with the dollar index, I see it coming in in the, in the euro around 114.90, 115. Yeah. And so uh, I think that's really the range for the time being. But I think that the euro also is seen as a laggard. And what the Europeans are talking about is what, what kind of bond buying facility do they want after the emergency one winds down? So yeah. What are we going to, what, what other acronym are we going to use after PEP? You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Mark, you know, I want to, I want to make sure that, uh, that, that, that maybe, you know, traders are kind of thinking about this in, in the right way. Um, you know, as long as equities don't, you know, have a, a major correction, which, you know, of course we're in a seasonal type of market right now where, where equities could continue to correct maybe another five, 7% from current levels. Um, as long as, Let's just call it the S and P holds above four thousand. You know, maybe that carry trade is a is a trade that 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 you 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 look to deploy, and maybe buying some yen pairs or selling yen on rallies or buying the dips in the yen pairs, as long as the S and P continues to hold up broad market. Obviously, speaking in generalities, right? Yeah, I, th I think that makes sense. I think that so. I'd be looking at uh, it, it fits in nicely with that theme too. I mean, that's why I think that the Canadian dollar is kind of interesting. Technically, it seems to me there's a head and shoulders pattern. It's broken down, projects towards, uh, say, uh, 123 or so dollar CAD. Yeah. Uh, Canada is kind of an interesting country because while the U.S., uh, Europe uh, will be having some fiscal, will be less aggressive, less stimulative fiscal policy, Japan and Canada have said that they're going to be having uh, more fiscal stimulus. And Canada, though, so I look for this policy mix. And it's like that we had under Reagan and Volcker, like we had a little bit under Trump of a uh, expanding fiscal policy, tight monetary policy. That policy mix for various reasons tends to be bullish for a currency. It is like the central bank's got its foot on the brake and the government's got its foot on the accelerator and the currency gets squeezed up in between. Yeah. And Canada's got that policy mix. So I like Canada, head and shoulders top, strong policy mix. And so I'd look at like Canada yen as a way to express that carry trade as well as get on maybe a faster horse in the U.S. dollar. Interesting. Well, Mark, I, that's a lot to unpack. And I, and, I, and, and I really like our yen conversation because obviously the yen is under pressure. We're seeing the yen pairs really starting to break higher. And I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, how high can they go? And uh, a range environment for the, for the dollar yen seems pretty likely uh, based on our conversation. So those traders out there expecting us to go back to 300 yen, probably not happening anytime near future, near future, right? <laughs> All right, Mark. Well, thank you so much for your time. And and, and by the way, I have to mention, um, you know, because I have been reading your daily column, uh, I want to say at least 12 years, maybe even longer than that. Um, can you tell us what it's been like for you to write your daily column for as long as you've been doing it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really for me, it's a really growing experience, you know, uh, hopefully by reading it, you might pick up something that you might not have seen otherwise, but by going through, a, it's really just a discipline. It's sort of like how we treat our bodies going to the gym or something. Uh, there's a certain discipline, a discipline in trading. And I think that this is just part of that discipline for me. It's uh, getting up, knowing that the sun does not rise and set in the United States. By the time we get up in the morning, a good half the day is over. Uh, Asia's done. Europe's done there with their morning. And so how, I, I sort of think of myself sometimes, that process is partly like tofu. You know, tofu is a partly digested soybean cheese, partly digested. And so what I'm trying to do is to digest it, all these news developments, put in the context of what's going on with the prices. That's ultimately what we're really interested in. And then being able to have the, my team, a team of salespeople I work with, have them be prepared so we don't all have to digest that soybean by ourselves. That's great. And, I, and my, my opinion is eat more so I mean, lose, lose more fat. So um, there we go. And Mark, I, I want to, I want to say you are a, a staple in my diet every morning. And for those of you that don't know this, Mark's uh, column is, is daily on Trader Summit. You can find it there. And you can also find out more about Mark by clicking in the link down below to get to Bannockburn Forex. Mark, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Thanks a lot. Good luck to everybody. Thank you. I'll look forward to our next meeting. Thanks again.